Hi, this is Graphically Alex coming at you with all things fat related. If that's something that interests you, please subscribe. I'd love to have you. Today, we are doing our next installment in the Queer Collective podcast, The Real Reason You Hate Fat People. I'm going to go ahead and just get right into it. I'm not going to pull any punches today if I feel like the witch hat needs to come out. It's coming out pretty fast because I don't even know if I'm going to try anymore. That being said, I am feeling a little bit more demure tonight because I got some herbal supplements to help with my thyroid. So I'm a little calmer, but I'm sure she can still get me there. I'm sure she can. So let's get started. And like yeah. people open the door for you and like yeah. things happen for you. And mm-hmm. I believe it. Like I know that to be true. Yeah. And then I, I gained all the way back and then it goes away and that's a part of it that does also feel heartbreaking because to me it's like that weight wasn't a natural weight for me at all. That was like eating a few cashews a day kind of a <laughs> no, vibe. Like would, it was she so would literally, unhealthy. when I first met her, which was, I think was at your lowest weight, right? Yeah, um, that's when I was unhealthiest. Yeah, you, she was, her entire diet consists. That's one of their favorite things. Um, and I'm not saying that this girl is huge. I don't know, you know, I'm not trying to say all that, but. A lot of times people will say, like, I was my most unhealthy when I weighed, when I was thinner, basically. And it's like, maybe in certain cases it can apply, but in the case of, like, being super morbidly obese, being, like, on this level, that's probably not true because you're already really unhealthy anyways. Like, I can honestly give my little anecdote and say I was 100% at my worst health-wise when I was the biggest I was at 383 pounds. I was at my worst, at my heaviest, 100%. So, no. Instead of popcorn and canned tomato soup. Like, that was it. And I hated myself, you know? It's like, that wasn't a nice vibe. (laughs) What's funny is that the... Yeah, well, you're not required to hate yourself to lose weight. That's not actually something that is forced upon you, Okay. And again, a lot of people get irritated. Well, not a lot, but sometimes people get irritated because I have to pause this so much to comment on things. But when you're doing this podcast, they put a lot of BS and I'm trying to sit here and address everything that they're telling you. And they kind of do this where they just do a string of BS. It's like string, it's like like really, 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 really fast. And these messages, they sink in to people who are in fat acceptance mindsets to people who are in toxic ritualistic mindsets, especially people who are super morbidly obese and who overly identify with their obesity. These strings of BS, they seep in. And so I have to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. She's telling you in order to lose weight, you have to hate yourself. That's not true. So that's why I have to pause it a lot. That's why it's going to take a while to get through this because they're doing it. It's like lightning round. And when I do these episodes, it's literally like I am doing like a a crash course or like I'm I'm in a challenge. Like it's like, oh, whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole. It's like this, 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 you know, that's how it feels on my end. (laughs) But anyways, let's do this. The way that we kind of turned that around was that I was doing like a dance gig where I was like doing cardio every single day. And... I would come over to her place like every night and because she only had like tomato soup and popcorn, I lost like 20 pounds. I lost a shit ton of weight. And then she was like, oh my God, I need to like start cooking. I think I need to like learn how to eat food. It's like body dysmorphia is so real. I didn't realize how thin I had become. And then it was kind of. Yeah, that's the thing too. You're not supposed to just only eat one thing. That is a part of a toxic ritualistic cycle. Um, A lot of people don't understand, but when it comes to the one where you eat too much, there is a side of it where you're not eating either enough or enough variety. And I have to speak very coded because YouTube doesn't like it if you say something outright about this. So you're going to have to follow me. I'm sorry. But there is a side to the one where you eat too much, where you either don't eat certain foods completely or like you don't eat enough variety or you don't eat 
enough calories, essentially. So I'm trying to say, it's, and it's a cycle. So remember, when we're talking about that particular one, there's three parts of the cycle. Three. There's, oh gosh, I have to speak so codedly. This is challenging. There's the part where you're, you know, not eating as much. The part where you really cannot stand your physical form and you're, you are obsessed with it. You stare in the mirror, that kind of stuff. And then there's the part where you're eating a lot in an anxiety-induced state. And typically, when you have that toxic ritualistic thing going on, you're usually in one of those three parts of the cycle. And you can spend months there, especially if it's very severe. You can do months here, months there, months there, you know. You can kind of, or you can switch through it really fast. It depends on the person. It depends on the triggers. It depends on all these different things. But that's what she's talking about. She has a problem. And again, I, I really, I'm trying my best to be a little bit more gracious, a little bit less judgmental in these types of things because people are not always aware that they have this. Part of it is delusion. Part of it is a refusal to acknowledge what is happening. And so I can't judge her because I've done that too. But with the way that she talked about her weight gain, like as if it was this inevitable thing that could never have been stopped, it's, it's a toxic ritualistic mindset. It's not real. It's a myth. So again, I talk a lot on the channel about the physical stuff and the mental stuff. And that is definitely something on the mental side that she's exposing in herself. I like looking in a mirror, but of a different body. And I was like, okay, this is fucked up, yeah. <laughs> you know? I think like, obviously body dysmorphia yeah. is like, you know, a disorder that is very complex and has yeah. like, lots of layers yeah. to it. But I do know that speaking to a lot of people that have lived with and continue to live with body dysmorphia is that like fat phobia lives rampant inside of our bodies yeah. right so much so that we're seeing a different version of ourselves and it's just so hard to see what we actually look like yeah. a lot of fat people have like what we call like reverse body dysmorphia where like you it's so hard to see the truth of like how large you are because of how society it's treats not you. necessarily it isn't necessarily reverse it's just the same thing like body dysmorphia it's not in one direction it i in my I think anyways, I mean, you guys can educate me if I'm wrong, but as far as I'm aware of, it's just that you're not seeing your body as it is. And I, I have had a couple of episodes recently. I try not to fixate upon it because I don't think it's productive or helpful. And I really, really promote body neutrality on this channel because the best thing that I've done in those situations is to just stop thinking about it and start thinking about something else. And I don't mean it in like a, oh, I have to suppress this. And uh, I just mean it in a, mm, I spent a minute on this. I'm not going to spend any longer. And I'm going to focus on something else now, you know, with very little emotion involved. Littlest amount of emotion possible is best because, you know, I have my moments too in weight loss. It is a trigger. It can be a trigger. And it is for a lot of people with this issue. And it still is a trigger for me, but again, I don't have that toxic ritualistic behavior. There's no connection to behavior anymore for me, but I still have to deal with the anxiety from it from time to time, but I just don't, I don't obsess and you can be okay. Um, it's okay. Like it, it will, the anxiety will probably go away and you'll probably stop anyways. Remember, it's an anxiety issue, primarily. Do you, that mm -hmm. like when you look in the mirror, you see a smaller version of yourself because it's easier to kind of like cope with living your life like that. And like also the way that we take selfies with our screens mm -hmm. and like different angles, like mm -hmm. we don't really yeah. always get to see ourselves the way that the world perceives us. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like less traumatizing to like have your brain imagine you smaller because mm -hmm. of how the world treats you. Um, but like working on internalized fat phobia, 
helps not only you, of course, and your own experience, your body, no matter what size you are, but obviously it's going to really help the world and everybody else around. And if you're doing what you suggest of making friends. I don't think you necessarily have to be quote unquote fat phobic or hate fatness or any of these things to lose weight. I think you can lose weight just being logical and, you know, just being like, yeah, this isn't healthy. You know, I focus a lot on numbers, primarily body fat percentage, estimations from my scale, that kind of thing. It keeps it more objective. It keeps it more uh, unemotional. I always try to promote on this channel, try to keep it as unemotional as possible. There's a reason why more logical people tend to be more successful in this venture. It's because they don't, they don't put a lot of emotion into the scale, for example. Um, so I don't really do that very much at all myself either anymore. And I've been the most successful I've ever been this time. So I think it's really important to always de-emotionalize the journey. Be emotional about everything else. That's fine. Don't be emotional about this, though. It's not going to help you. It doesn't help. Who are fat, it's like I would recommend doing the work before you do that so you're not like projecting negative things onto your friends. Yeah, that's, also... that's so true. That's what you yeah. want. Something so so wholesome that I like love so much about my partner is that when we first started dating, there was like these small moments where I was like, I don't like what you said that. You know, or like, oh, you don't understand. Like, yeah, you don't know yeah. what I'm talking about. And I remember I was very brave and she's such a safe person that, you mm -hmm. know, I knew this was going to hopefully turn out right. But I remember mm -hmm. texting her. I didn't tell her in person. I was sooner I texted okay. her. And I was like, something happened in a group. And she didn't see that there was fat phobia happening actively mm. because it's so quiet usually. So I remember I sent her a text and I was like, I would really appreciate it if you did some research on body positivity and um, the fat experience. If you're going to date me, it would mean a lot to me. And oh. she did. And she Ooh, sorry, that was really cringy. Um, this is just, this is just my opinion, but oh my gosh, like there are already so many, you know, questions and doubts and things within a relationship. Like I do not want this to be another thing to add to it. You know, I do. I I've said on the channel before. I would appreciate somebody that has understanding of the toxic ritualistic mindsets and behaviors just because it was such a huge part of my life for such a long time and I likely will have scars from that. But by all means, I can explain it to my future partner. Yeah, I'll just say boyfriend. I can explain it to my future boyfriend. I can explain it. I don't have to... He wouldn't have to educate himself if he didn't understand. I could tell him, you know, because I can advocate for myself, for one, and I can do my best to see good intentions in my boyfriend or potential, you know, future boyfriend or whatever you want to call it, future boyfriend. I can see the best intentions in him. I don't have to assume that he's hating me because I used to be fat or because I'm fat or because whatever. It's just ugh, like, why would you want another layer on there. I just wouldn't want it personally. And I wouldn't want to deal with it myself. You know? Like, no, this is cringy to me. It's just very cringe. And it's fine. Like, it worked for them. That's great. It's just, that's my opinion. That's just my opinion. And she started listening to a podcast. I don't want my weight to become my boyfriend's baggage. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't want that because it's something that I've taken responsibility for and I don't want to put that on someone else. So I, I do my best to just let it be and just try to think of stuff like, you know, if this guy is talking to me or if this if this guy is this or if this guy is that, he's obviously attracted to me. So I don't have to doubt that he's attracted to me. Does that make sense? So I try to just break through some of those insecurities and those mindsets in regard to 
my physical form. I try to break through that using logical thoughts and just, again, cutting off the emotion behind it. Because in my opinion, when we have struggled with toxic ritualistic mindsets, viewing our bodies emotionally is something I don't think we should do anymore because it's a little bit dangerous for us, if that makes sense. And I don't mean it in a way to freak you out, but it's just if you really, really dive into that and you start feeling all these things about your body for hours on end, days on end, all these things all the time, I think it can put you at risk for relapse. That's my opinion. And dating can be a trigger. And so it's important to not become obsessed with our physical form in that and putting emotion and projecting emotion on a potential partner. I think it's bad. I think it's risky or it's, it's a little bit, it pushes you closer to a relapse in my opinion. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes, it's called She's So Fat and would like learn and research and do all these things. And then we'd have these conversations. She would like bring up some knowledge. I'd be like, that's so nice. How did you learn that? She's like, well, well, I just, I've been reading articles, you know, and that made me feel like so, so loved and Mm. safe. And like Mm -hmm. I could share my experiences with her. Yeah. That meant the world to me. So. I, I really that. recommend that people do that as well before befriending a bad person. A hundred percent. Before I- befriending, hun, friendships are not supposed to be the most high effort relationships that we have. Oh gosh. I'm j- Okay. I hope that today's episode will also be like a nice resource for people to listen to as well. Um, that'll be really helpful. I find a lot of misconceptions that people have about mm-hmm. fat people and judgments and stereotypes are so, so harmful and so um, untrue that I need to talk about them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some of them are that we are like not strong willed people. We're like weak character, you mm-hmm. know, because like we just don't stop eating. Right. We don't care for ourselves or our bodies or our lives. Another thing, people often... I would not agree with weak-willed. That's not necessarily true. There are fat people that are weak-willed. There are fat people who are not. I do not agree with that assumption. If you are just somebody who's never been fat, you're seeing fat people on the street, don't just assume that somebody's weak-willed. There's a lot of very ambitious people who are fat. There are a lot of fat people who overwork have more than one job there's a lot of fat people that are go 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 you can't assume that a fat person is doing anything other than overeating honestly um and in some cases they can be overeating due to hormone issues so you can't like assume that much other than that they're technically overeating as far as the don't care about your health don't care about this don't care about that if they're not actively trying to do something about it, there's truth to that one. I'm sorry. I think that we're smelly and like we don't take care of our hygiene because how could we? Like we don't take care of ourselves. I remember one time I saw this horrible video of like this. these. Again, I'm sure some people are, some people aren't. Lesbians on TikTok talking about like I would never hook up with a fat queer because like they smell bad. I could never like deal with the smell. Pure fat phobia. Yeah. And actually, like the majority of fat people that I know, especially femmes or women that are fat, go like above and beyond to be like the most delicious smelling, like most hygienic people that I know by far mm-hmm. because of this stereotype. Because yeah. they like. I think it just depends on the person. I think this is really individual. But I think what those lesbians should have just said is I don't want to be with a fat person because I'm not attracted. I think that that probably is more honest and, you know, yeah, it's, it's deadpan. Yeah. It's critical. Yeah. It's these kind of things, whatever. That's their prerogative. It's everybody's right to be discerning in who they want to date. And it's everybody's right to date who they're attracted to. Okay. Which I think they should just say that I'm not attracted to very fat women. Okay, move along, you know?
the worst thing I can imagine is someone think like, oh, you're fat and smelly, you know, because that's a thing. It's like a real thing because I have like rolls and I, you know, things rub up against her and it gets hot up in here. And like the fat people that I know are like the most deliciously smelling. Like we work hard because of this stereotype. Whereas like there are some like, you know, <laughs> now I'm like going to talk. I think you have to because there's a lot of rolls and stuff. You have to kind of be on top of it. You know, like. I'm just saying. Well, stereotype. There's like you know some like real hot queers who are like thin and like smell, you know, and the, but it's that like natural. That natural deodorant isn't it's doing like, what you think it's doing. It's not doing it. Like they're natural. I know because I tried it and it's not doing what I think it's doing. <laughs> well, sure. Some people smell. Sure. You know, it's it's very individual. This is just very individual. And, like, some of them, because they're so, like, you know, conventionally attractive, yeah. it's, like, a hot thing about them. You know, it's, like, yeah. oh, it's, they're, like, they live life. They're, so they're smelly. Musk. But if I'm yeah. smelly, I am, like, disgusting. Yeah. 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 So that's a big thing that really bugs yeah. me particularly. Yeah. And that we're not hot or, like, yeah. desirable and, like, we're not you know, experienced in love and sexuality and all of these mm. things is so not true. But the the truth is, is that, like, people are so fat phobic that, yeah, there's groups of people that want nothing to do with us. But, like, you're, you're not going to want to get involved with someone who is, like, so aware of themselves and the people around them. They're so generous and so giving. Like, that sounds like... I know, but you can't do, like, positive stereotyping either. Like, you can't be mad at negative stereotypes, but then try to uplift positive ones. It doesn't work that way. Fat people are individuals. They're all different. That's it. You know, as far as attraction or if you're hot or not or all these different things, typically health is an indicator of hotness biologically on a biological level for the vast majority of people. There are going to be some people who are into very, very big people certain niche so that does exist and that can work you know I guess if you don't want to lose the weight but at the end of the day most people will have more dating options if they are a more normal weight and not super morbidly obese that's a fact doesn't mean that you have no options doesn't mean that you can't find somebody that you're looking for it doesn't mean any of these other things. That's not true. But regardless of all of this, your health is still going to be very negatively affected. And at super morbidly obese levels, especially the longer you stay there, it tends to become mental health issues too, which can definitely sabotage relationships. So I would be very wary about just staying a huge size and thinking it doesn't matter or it's not going to affect you. Because it will. Like pretty great to me. Like being with fat people is like a beautiful, lovely, chubbalicious experience. <laughs> that I think everybody should experience at least yeah. once. You know? Yeah, and I think something really interesting just on the sex side is like us not. I always wonder why they try to promote it so much because the thing about being attractive is you don't have to tell people that you're attractive. They just find you attractive. They usually will tell you or they act in a certain way where you can tell that they're attracted to you. You don't have to tell somebody that they are. So it's always weird when they do that because it's kind of like you're, when you're constantly advocating for that, you're kind of admitting that it's not true in a way. Just saying not realizing how much of our sexual attractions are based on what we're worried of what other people are going to think and like what we think society i think this is a lot more true for women than men um i think women are you know they're more social in certain ways i don't know how else to say it so this can definitely be more true for women but for men it's very very hardwired i don't know how else to explain it um, I usually will use my sexuality as an example. I was not ever encouraged to be gay. It was actually very discouraged. I went to pretty hardcore 
evangelical Christian private school as a kid. And it was very, very unencouraged to be gay. And that was my world. And it was not something that was ever promoted in society. And I did not, it didn't make a difference. It didn't make a lick of a difference. I still was gay as a day in May. So it is ironic that they're making these arguments when they are the queer collective because, you know, I guess you're going against the grain or a little bit, right? I don't know. You're not just straight or whatever. So it's like, was heterosexuality not promoted in society? Was, were people not shamed for being gay when you were growing up? Did that change your attraction at all? Probably not. You know, it's a very weird argument. Maybe for these women, maybe it did. I don't know. I'm not a woman. I don't have a woman's brain. It's not as fluid. But I can assure you, from a male perspective, it's pretty hardwired. Very much so. So this is, this falls very flat, in my opinion, from my perspective. It is up to, mm -hmm. because even just looking back historically, it's like bigger bodies used to be so celebrated and like yeah. an image of beauty. And it's like these things just... Not that big, though. They over-exaggerate that. ...start to shift throughout history. Well, I come from Colombia, and not currently, but back, back, back in the day, fat bodies were really celebrated because it meant that you were wealthy enough to eat that much, mm. which was yeah. is really interesting. Um, makes sense. So uh, a term of endearment was to call somebody gordo, which means, like, fat guy, or yeah. gord gordita. It's like, mm. my Ooh. my fat little woman, you know? <laughs> like, it, it was, it's actually... Well, and sure. It's, because especially if people are really, 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 really skinny where you're at because of lack of food and stuff, or like you said, lack of money, that would make sense. But it doesn't affect the health consequences of being super morbidly obese. None of this is relevant to that whatsoever. So even people in olden days, you know, like medieval times and things like that, and the Egyptian era like if you go back to the pyramids and all that a lot of those people had diabetes like the pharaohs and stuff for people that have money that ate a lot they were diabetic they've had evidence they've done like autopsies and stuff they had clogged arteries they had like a lot of the same problems that people have today because they were obese and so it's not good for you it doesn't matter if it's a status symbol it's still not good for you a status symbol is not always good for you. So to me, this is just irrelevant. Health consequences still exist, regardless of if somebody finds you attractive or not. And I don't think it's the most important thing in the world, in my opinion. I get that. I'm in my 30s now. I get that I have a different perspective than I probably used to when I was younger. But the health is much more important, much more. It's still used today as a term of yeah. endearment. Um, like my mom all the time to my dad, gordo, and it's like, it's sweet. It's not like, like that. at all meant as a discriminatory or yeah, kind yeah. of word. I think what's interesting kind of on the fact you brought up is now with how expensive diet culture is and like this lifestyle of the almond. It's also very expensive to eat large amounts of food all the time. Do not even get me started on that. Every time I ever did a diet, it was always cheaper than when I was eating a lot in an anxiety induced state. It was always much cheaper. At my worst, back in 2018, which is quite a while ago, you know, numbers were different as far as how much food cost. I got to a point where I was spending $60 a day. $60 a day, 7,500 calories a day for months. You don't think that's expensive? This is such a lie. Ooh, it's a lie, especially... Imagine you're going out to eat all the time. It's expensive, especially today. 
oh my gosh, you're going to break the bank. All those trips to McDonald's now, oof, cost a lot of money now. Food costs a lot more than it did then. I think what I was eating then, now it would probably be almost $100 a day because I was eating a lot. So it's like, let's be so real. Part of what has helped me in this time where food costs have gone up so much has actually been being in a deficit. I have actually saved a lot of money being in a deficit. It has kept my life affordable to be in a deficit. There's no way I could eat as much as I used to eat. I could not afford it. So I always think that this argument is hilarious because it's so out of touch, especially where, with where most people are, where they cannot afford to just eat huge amounts of food every day. Like You have to be very privileged to be able to do that especially today, you know, even back then I wasn't paying rent in 2018. That's why I could do it. So to try to make the argument that eating tons of food is not as expensive as being an almond mom or whatever, it's not true whatsoever. I'm just saying it it is just ridiculous to me. It is absolutely ridiculous and mom of like going to Whole Foods and yeah. these juice cleanses, like it's oh, very right. expensive. It's like now. Yes, but like I said, so is eating large amounts of food. Now being in a really thin fit body is yeah. actually seen as a sign of wealth because of how easy it is to access all of this processed food. It's like, it's kind of switched. Things have shifted, yeah. It's switched. There's yeah, like the well, you guys need to figure out your narrative because is it totally genetic? Is it something that just happens is this just the size that you're meant to be or is it the food that you're eating that's making you fatter you kind of flip-flop there where you're like that size was not my healthy size when I was thinner because I could barely eat but also barely eating costs so much money and I got fatter because of the processed food that's more affordable it doesn't make any sense. You need to figure that out in your mind. That's really wild. Book called Fearing the Black Body mm. by Sabrina. Okay, so we're going back to the race thing. They are obsessed with that book. I believe Sam at Every Size did a video series on it. I'm going to suggest you guys check that out if you want like a deep dive on it. But they are obsessed with that book strings that is is a really important read because it explains how basically fat phobia is rooted in racism yeah. and like we're talking about these shifts that happen throughout time and how mm -hmm. like having a big fat body was celebrated and it was like you have wealth like you're eating good mm -hmm. like not that big because you would get to freak show levels you're healthy like you're incredible we, we yeah. look up to you somehow mm -hmm. shifted over time and this book d will do a much better job than i could ever do talking about this but mm -hmm. basically you know s along the way we decided to go with the eurocentric kind of like vision of what beauty is and like mm -hmm. thinness and whiteness basically mm -hmm. and how like that has become what we strive for because curvaceousness fatness is like so are they arguing that this is what goes on in east asia too like are they also pursuing a eurocentric ideal by their in their opinion or many other places throughout the world where it's not acceptable to be super morbidly obese it's only europe only europe It's a tough sell for me. Very much associated with different ethnic groups, especially mm -hmm. like black women. So the BMI mm -hmm. was created by a Belgian man, a 19th mm -hmm. century. And he was a mathematician, not even a physician. And it basically was a way of, at the time, trying to figure out what like the average male is with height and weight, and then, you know, making a chart to configure that. And we, we still use the same one. The, the most common thing that people talk about when they talk about the illegitimacy of the BMI is like, mm -hmm. we talk about weightlifters, you know, like people 
people with muscles and how yeah. they're the the epitome of health and when they the, when they are on their chart they're like considered obese but they're clearly not because mm-hmm. it's all muscle weight so it doesn't work i've gone to a good life at like 200 pounds so what i will say is i have a bit of a nuanced take on bmi bmi it's good for obesity so when we're thinking about actual obesity the different levels are very relevant so when you have like obese morbidly obese super morbidly obese those categories are super 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 useful so if you are an obese person I would listen to the BMI within those categories because you do have a different experience of obesity across different levels and it's very helpful to explain i've used it to explain what's happening throughout my weight loss journey on this channel and i really appreciated it and i've used it to have more medical or health categories of where i'm at because i'm still very much at a point in my weight loss journey where this is almost entirely for my health because it's very important to get to a healthy weight and I am still not at a healthy weight. I'm still technically morbidly obese. So it's very relevant because I noticed a huge shift going from super morbidly obese to morbidly obese. And I told you guys I had a transition period about two to three months because it's not like a light switch. And the thing that a lot of people don't understand is it's not just that you get under that bracket, you have to stay under it for months and then you start to get the health benefit because we always think of weight as, oh, if I just get under that number on the scale, then I'm good. No, you have to maintain it under that number. You have to maintain for a while and then you recover. So I'm currently in a process where as I'm approaching obesity from morbid, I'm at the very end, I'm transitioning health-wise and starting to have some of the morbidly obese issues. They're starting to wane and I'm starting to enter into a new experience, but it takes months. So a lot of people don't understand that because they typically, they have toxic ritualistic mindsets and behaviors and they don't stay down. They go down and up, down and up, down and up. They do that a lot. Well, you're not going to get as much of a benefit from that. And I think that's why a lot of them don't see that. So what I will say as far as the BMI is very good in terms of obesity. Once you're out of obesity and you're just like overweight, I think body fat percentage is king in that. And I will no longer use BMI. I will be talking about body fat percentage after I get out of obesity but I'm going to continue to use it no matter how much it pisses them off until I'm out of obesity because I think it's relevant. Pounds. They called me obese. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? I was one of those power lifters, though, that had like a lot yeah. of extra muscle back in the day. Yeah. And I was also considered obese. Because That's why I'm like, this shit like, doesn't make sense. I'm like, obviously not, but like... W- As we're joking about, you know, like, people are just being called, like, overweight due to this number on this system, right? Mm. And it doesn't make any sense, but where it really affects a lot of people are, again, like, black women, people mm. who, like, you know, are not thin white mm. women or thin yeah. white men, which is what the mm. actual BMI was made to, to like, measure. Cool. And they're getting on these you know, scales and looking at these charts and they're Mm -hmm. like scoring in these places that affect them in a really, really negative way, not just psychologically because you're being called obese or whatever term, but also Mm -hmm. for life. Like, for example, a lot of systems still use BMI for insurance purposes. Wait, what? Yeah. Like life insurance kind of Yeah, life insurance. So you may be somebody that if I look at you, you don't even look fat but because you live in a curvaceous body or a marginalized body you may score differently on that scale and then so fat they're mixing two different words so like obese is an objective thing in the sense that you weigh a certain amount at your height even if somebody has a lot of muscle they might still have too much fat that's possible okay overweight though like i said i think it gets a lot more gray in the overweight zone because I think you could definitely be lean enough to be healthy and still 
have a lot of muscle, you just wouldn't necessarily be like super athletic or like cut or whatever, right? At that level. But it's like, I think that's when you're looking at obesity, obesity, it's kind of a lot. You weigh a lot, you know. It's not like a casual thing. Like if you're like a mega bodybuilder, maybe. But that's not typically going to be the case. Typically, it'll be you have muscle, but you're also still kind of fat a little bit. You know what I'm saying? It's a gradient. But what, what they're doing with the BMI and the fat, the word fat, is they're mixing subjective. Subjective, fat is a subjective word. So fat is kind of in the eye of the beholder. There's a lot of people where you'll be like, oh, you're not fat. Oh, you're fat. And people will see different people differently. People can even see themselves differently. But in terms of obesity, it is tied to more of an objective number and measurement. So you can't really say, I feel obese. It doesn't make sense. They're mixing that together. And they do that a lot because they are trying to muddy the waters. I think the primary reason they do this is they don't want you to differentiate between somebody who's 10 pounds overweight and somebody who's 200 pounds overweight. They want to make it like it's exactly the same. And that is a way for them to cloudy, like to make the issue cloudier so that people get confused. And so then they don't pursue weight loss. That's what I think it is. You guys can let me know your opinions. I think I'm going to go ahead and call it here. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will be back with another part next Thursday. I actually stayed demure today. So yay. I guess my herbs worked so far. I will talk to you guys again soon. Have a good rest of your day, night, whatever. Peace. Bye.